back to Access to Perspectives Conversation. My name is Jo Haberman and with me here today is Julie Wren. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Jo. Lovely to be here. It's great having you. So, Julie, your work as a we go, wellness consultant, nutritional therapist, and World Wellness Weekend Ambassador. All of the three we will go into um, in a little bit more detail. Why you're here in um, with how how you work, well, basically I invited you. I'm happy to, to know you through a networking, uh, a business network. And I think that your services and your expertise can be of very much um, of high value also for academics and um, PhD students in particular, but also more senior level researchers, um, as there's oftentimes quite a high pressure point or several pressure points that researchers experience. And your profession and expertise lies in the mental well-being or like overall also including physical well-being. And the question now is how can um, high achievers or people who dedicate their life to work, like many researchers mm -hmm. also do, uh, maintain uh, well-being and wellness and, and take care of themselves to be able to perform? to their highest possible potentials, um, which um, oftentimes also lies within their purpose um, and without exhausting ourselves, really. So that's basically, um, yeah, what our discussion today rotates around. Would you- Thank you, Jen. <laughs> yeah. um, Would you probably start by sharing a little bit about your, your professional, roots so far what what made you look into nutritional therapy and how you combine um, that now with well-being and wellness overall in a professional context like what is your journey that brought you here okay well i think my journey with nutrition first started back when my mother became diagnosed with a cancer that took her very quickly and I became very frustrated that there was no nutritional advice given to her. And she was sort of slipping away from us because she could hardly eat. And even though that we knew that it wasn't going to extend her life, I always felt that she could have had a better quality end of life. Mm. And sort of that really um, got me thinking about health and wellness. And then not long after that, actually due to her passing, I really threw myself 100% into my work. I was working at that time for on projects funded by the European Commission. And I think I was just running away from having to face up to the loss of my mom. And I really literally drove myself into the ground. I mean, to, the, to one point where I was in a meeting with some ministers and I passed out onto the, uh, the table. And I really, you know, hadn't realized how hard I had been pushing myself and driving myself working. I think it was across three different countries across, across the Baltic states. We had loads of projects going on at the time. And it was a, kind of like a wake up call that said, you know what, you, you get to choose what kind of life you have. And it was at that point that I made the mental decision to start to turn my life around, but it didn't happen immediately. There was no actual, um, let's say, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna quit my job. It, it took a long time because obviously these are habits, the way we live and the way that we approach our work and we see our life purpose as it were, is something that drives us. And when you start to make changes, it's not an easy change process. So I think, but with that, um, my own taking my own personal journey, it took me a number of years to really arrive at the point where I stepped into that new career as a nutritional therapist. So I started before that sort of engineering, if you like, changes uh, by first going into more wellness techniques and massage, and then little by little, again, understanding more and more how nutrition affects us so I think in answer to your question about how do busy professionals um, make changes I think the first thing that we have to do is realize that there is something that's not right that we're doing for us and that's probably the biggest challenge because it implies change and everybody has a slight aversion to change 
So, you know, being honest with yourself and saying the way I am living is not helpful or there is one thing that I'm doing that is driving my, my feelings of ill health. And it's acknowledging that for yourself and identifying it. And then I think after that, it's about saying, well, what, what am I ready to change? What kind of help do I need to do that change? Because as I said, it, it's never a straight line and it can seem incredibly overwhelming to turn your life around or upside down as some people think about it is when we have to make changes that affect our, are, are gonna be affecting our health more positively. Yeah, I also found for myself to realize that I was not um, eating healthy and then changing habits is always like a big um, thing to overcome or like a lot of work <laughs> to yeah. you know, just yep. kind of diet. And then it's about, yeah, it's about recognizing as well, what are we putting into our body? Is it healthful? Because at the end of the day, you know, we sometimes are on autopilot and we grab the first thing to hand. And sometimes it's not always the most helpful thing. And then we get into that habit and then we start to get a little bit, uh, let's say like the sugar addiction or the addiction to fat and to salt. I mean, these do have, a, have an effect on, on the way that our bodies function. And there is that kind of, hits that sweet spot as we call it, where it's about satisfaction and reward. So I think we, we also need to look at our relationship or we, I would advise people to always look at their relationship, first of all, to food and nutrition and to see whether that in itself is, is helpful. Mm. Uh, in your, um, in your, what is it? Um, as you learned about nutritional therapy, is time also one of the major reasons for unhealthy food because I I experienced in my PhD program there was never enough time uh, people are often expected or put pressure on themselves to work extra hours like every day hardly mm -hmm. ever to take holidays and that leads to a state where you forget about food or you don't think you have time to take a um, mm -hmm. amount of time to eat healthy to think about what to prepare and to get yeah. all the important um, ingredients into your system. So, um, yeah, what are the major components or factors that lead to unhealthy eating in a like high-performing work environment? I think you hit the nail on the head. It's that perception of time, because again, don't forget time is a construct. Mm -hmm. So mm. we know uh, for ourselves that some days we feel like there's as I said to you before we got on here, my goodness, it felt like May is here and April just, just evaporated. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes time can seem very uh, long and drawn out. So it, it, is a, it is a mind construct. But again, we get to choose how we organize our time. And I'm always looking with my clients to find how do we, how do we build let's say small gains, small wins in their daily agenda. What, could, what is the one thing, the one big thing that we could change? And then we focus on that in terms of time. So for example, you know, we, all, we all know that starting the, the, the day right with a good breakfast or having food at the right time is important to keep the brain functioning because the brain is a very, very hungry, hungry organ. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 3% uh, of our body weight, but needs a quarter of the energy. So, you know, if you think about the kind of jobs and, and, and um, let's say mental agility that perhaps some of your researchers are, are using and demanding, you know, they're going to be needing a lot of energy for that brain. And it's about choosing the right kind of energy so that you, you maintain your energy level. So I would be looking with somebody, say, what can we leverage the most? What are you not doing? And for example, recently I worked with a lady and it was all about breakfast. It was about, she wasn't eating breakfast. She wasn't hungry when she woke up. So we started to explore what that looked like if she could eat breakfast. What would we have to do in terms of gain some time? Whether that's preparing something the night before. So it's literally in the fridge, ready to be eaten when you wake up. Um, 
and what kind of things to eat to get the best kind of energy that she would need to get through her day. So I think it's a very much a personalized approach, but there is always a moment in the day when we can make a little bit of time that will actually save us time going forward. Yeah, yeah it's basically at the end of the day, it's also about time management and planning ahead. I experienced also when I had low levels of iron in my blood or other nutri uh, nutritional factors missing or like at the brink of like low level um, due to unbalanced uh, consumption or because I was working or exercising too much and not looking after my nutrition, I could feel like um, like a feeling of almost anxiety or I was uneasy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and that's maybe some of us can also relate, some of the listeners, that it's it's important to, to have a healthy system and to feed our, our body in a way that we get all the nutri nut nutrients to to stay active and functional. Yeah. Not like as, as physical beings and also for the brain work that we do as researchers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's as well, it's about self-respect and uh, realizing that self-care is really important because if you're working on something really major um, and you're having you're about to have a major breakthrough you know you having a breakdown at that particular point is not going to be great for the project so you you realizing that I think it's it's a benefit it's not about this is not a time investment or time loss or just something else i have to tick off my to-do list mm. by you know eating a healthy breakfast i think it's about looking at the relationship and saying for, i give that an example that how this is an integral part of your success story you know in terms of getting your research to where you want it to get it to and i think this applies across the board you know everybody will 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 be able to understand this no matter what industry you're in is that you you are a key component of that success story and therefore you need to be really firing on all four cylinders to make that happen and if you're not then that's taking responsibility for that if things are not happening the way you want them to it's about taking a step back actually and saying what could I be doing differently that's going to get me a different result? Because if we keep on getting the same results, there must be something in this particular scenario that's not working. If we're still waking up and we're having zero energy, we're not managing to get through the day without 10 cups of coffee or that glass of whatever at the end of the day, it, it means that something needs to shift. Mm -hmm. And if we just make one, if we can identify that one shift that could make the difference, then the second one becomes easier and so on and so on like that. So I think that's the most, the key thing. I think in our hearts, we know what we need to do. It's just implementing it becomes such a difficulty. And that's where obviously, you know, working together with somebody um, from our, well, in the wellness industry really helps you get perspective on that and guides you. It's not about forcing you. It's not about, oh, you're going to make me give up this or do that. This is about, you know, being, I would say it's like being a detective, a Sherlock Holmes. It's about working out what is that one thing. Again, like in an experiment, I guess, you're looking for that one thing that is going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. And you're tweaking around and you're playing around with different elements and or chemical formulas. And suddenly, you know, you find that, you know, that eureka moment and you find what you're looking for. I always say that it's, it's personalized. Nutrition is personalized. There's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. It's also a level of accountability, so you don't have to struggle through the change yourself, but you have somebody to guide you through and to also try and experiment different options and then, but yeah. all well informed to make yeah. sure. That not everybody gets a kick out of kale, you know. So you know, we, we, you know, we need to find the right. We need to oh, find yeah. the right vegetable, the one that's going to make you sing and dance, or the right combination of of how do we like with children? How do you hide the vegetables? You know, we need to find a way to 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 make people again fall in love with things 
that are going to, you know, get them that uh, um, sharp brain function, mm. uh, strengthen their body and keep their blood sugar nicely balanced so that they are very even and not so uh, getting, mm. ah, as we say, hangry, hungry and angry. Angry, yeah. And like the way what you said earlier, like it's a level of self-respect to eat well and to make time for eating and mm. good eating and getting rid of bad he- eating habits um or like too much alcohol to 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 get rid of the stress that accumulates over the day and weeks or frustrations that we find (laughs) from repetitive experiment that never get the results or bring about the results we were hoping for like being a researcher can be like painfully frustrating which then often leads in bad eating habits or consumption habits Um, But it's also a level of accountability to the research team and the project at large. And first and foremost, as you mentioned, self-respect, like we shouldn't shouldn't punish ourselves and our body for stress that's uh, incurred onto us or that we also put on our own shoulders instead. So yeah, this is also what I I try to achieve with access to perspectives as a community um to create a an environment where researchers can look after themselves find a balance between work and life and for me that's one thing because we're still the same person in both Mm. chapters but um but of course yeah yeah there's a level of separation between the two maybe we can also talk a little bit about that um and then yeah so in order all of of that in order to perform well. And as researchers, um, there's two major groups that that seem to exist, like those who enjoy research for curiosity's sake, like to explore, to learn more, to understand and be in awe of nature or whatever they're studying. And then there's those who are purpose-driven, who want to make a positive impact on whatever subject and discipline into the world. and the purpose-driven ones might experience, I don't know if they experience even more pressure. I think the pressure is actually in the system. There's a lot of debate about um, academia desperately needing some revolutionary overhaul mm-hmm. um, in terms of how success is being measured um, for research and how then the research findings are being further disseminated. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, maybe let's talk a little bit about the work-life balance. So mm-hmm. in your view, can these two be separated? Like, for example, if we have a mother who's also a researcher, the child is going through some things, of course it would affect her work. And how is it then possible to maintain well-being mentally and physically, to be a good mother and to perform at work? Like, is there something that like some tips that you would or also a father or some you know um or any anyone with responsibilities at home like for me it's oftentimes that when my dog is sick i would still worry and have a hard time mm-hmm. focusing on work yeah. is there a way nutrition can help us to balance also to to yeah ease our brains to perform in both yeah i mean you know nutrition and brain health is uh, uh you know, something that I'm very passionate about has been that if you're not getting the right um, nutrition, then obviously, you know, we we can be putting ourselves perhaps in a position where we might be more anxious or even to the point of, you know, I, I did some research um, when I was studying into the link between depression and how we could address that with um, with food. So I think from a perspective of how do you manage your your home life, well, let's start off with some of the basic tasks. Obviously, you want your children to be to be fit and healthy and to be happy. Um, and what does that look like in terms of, uh, is, is, you know, are you putting food on the table that is for them also nourishing and is going to keep them in a non-hyper state? Mm-hmm. So, you know, making, making food choices there that, uh, you know, f- I get it. I get it. I understand it that, you know, sometimes it's easier just to go for the stuff that's already pre-packed and pre-prepared, but it's perhaps saying, well, maybe within that I could make some choices of 
more healthier options where there's less sugar, less fat, less, less, um, less salt. Uh, or, you know, something you can do as a fun as a family is say, OK, well, let's just pick one day a week and together we batch cook. It's a great time to be social together. Mm-hmm. Um, it does require a little bit of planning up front. But once you get into the habit of, of it, it, again, it's one of those things that ultimately saves you time. So you can actually plan your meals ahead of time. Um, I would also say, you know, looking at some of the tasks around the home, you know, is this a time when you could be looking at getting somebody in? Because again, that person coming in, you could be offering them a job, somebody who may love to do the cleaning or, or love to do a bit of cooking for you or love to pick up the kids. You know, this is, this is, these are jobs that, you know, some people are actually want to do. So by being able to offer somebody employment, you know, that is also a, a, a great social, let's say, social contribution as well. It's not to be seen as something that is, oh, look at her, you know, she can afford to have somebody come in. Mm. It's more about, I'm, I, I need to be working at a certain level, therefore I need help. And that help comes in the form of somebody to do my laundry or somebody to, to for me to farm my ironing out because it means I've got more quality time with my kids. So it's about, you know, where, where can I leverage uh, the time I have, the funds I have mm. to get the best, possible, the best possible combination that suits my family life. But I think, again, it comes to the fact where everybody in the family has to be part of that story as well. So it shouldn't necessarily fall to that one person, that one parent or two parents. You know, even the children themselves have a certain responsibility within that family unit, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, doing their chores, like in the old fashioned way, we used to do chores. Um, But uh, hopefully that answers uh, some questions there. But for me, it's it's about carving out important moments. I think so, yeah. I, I think so too, in the sense like, and how the two work and life balance with each other are also integrated. So Joe, it's the same way, again, it's about where are my boundaries? It's about setting personal boundaries. And I think it's about for your research teams, it's also about setting respectful boundaries for everybody in that team. So if, if I was gonna put together a team, I would actually, you know, part of, you know, we're setting up the team, you obviously have some operating practices and, and there's a working methodology, but why not include in that methodology or that way that you set up some ethics, some ethics about personal boundaries, about respecting each other's time and do that as a, as a group so that you all have like a manifesto, if you like, uh, a well-being manifesto built into your research program. So that, you know, we're looking out for signs and signals of colleagues who are struggling. Mm -hmm. And what would we do in that case? You know, how would we be able to respond to that as a team? How does that sound? That sounds like, yeah, music to my ears, because there is an an uptake of ethics or values driven research when it comes to why do we do the work that we do? Yeah. And then also it's important, like you said, for everybody in a team or in the family to understand what is each of our motivation to this project? Why are we here? What, what can we get out of, of, out of it for each of us? What does everybody bring to the project? What's everyone's responsibility? And yeah, what gets us out of bed? And this can be different yeah. things for, for each team member. And, to and, you know, and if you see somebody, you know, yeah. one of your team members has has less time than another one. Maybe you know, you're they're not perhaps family people, but they're they're singles. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, buddying up, buddying up to help each other out. Maybe one of the team members loves to cook, and you could get together and say, well, who's going to bring in and share the responsibility, maybe, of making sure that there's always a healthy lunch option available to the mm-hmm. team. Is that by somebody researching a local company who can deliver? Or is the campus got a restaurant um, nearby that you know is serving much more healthier options? And that's where you all go. That's what you favour uh, as your place to go. And I think another thing is respecting the lunch break. You know, you have a right to step away from your desk or your experiments or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, this is the one thing that 
I am a no negotiating on is that even if it is just 10 minutes, I prefer 20 minutes, excuse me, but step away, give yourself a brain break. This is the kindest thing you can do and take that time to mindfully eat. Yeah, and I, I remember my, so my PhD supervisor, he also had um, created a culture prize. We were quite a small research team. And he said, let's all go to lunch together. It wasn't obligatory, but we were invited to join them for lunch and then not talk about work during lunch, yeah. like deliberately. <laughs> we could have yeah. team meetings for that, obviously, but then yeah. also to be able to bond, get to know each other a little better, like have together time of the work topics and of the stress that comes with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe sometimes also have dedicated work lunches, but that's only on, upon mutual agreement if time was scarce otherwise yeah. or if there is no any pressure. I think it has to be a cultural thing. I think it comes as well with perhaps within the research space. Uh, somebody said needs to be the first. It's always like the pioneering, isn't it? Somebody needs to be the first one to go out there and say, Do you know what? We are going to do it differently. It's going to be probably a little bit painful to start with because we are going to be going against a way of working that we've always done for so many years. But it takes that one, let's say, research group to be the ones to pioneer a new way of thinking and a new way of working mm -hmm. that puts the human back at the center. Mm -hmm. You know, you you were doing something for the greater good in terms of your research, but it still requires a humanistic approach. You know, everybody in that team is a human being and has rights and needs. When I was in Sweden, I did my undergraduate studies in Sweden and the Swedish people as a community or as a population have this afternoon break or coffee break. It's holy for them, like non-negotiable. 3 p.m. You have, it's like 5 p.m. tea in mm. England. Mm. Um, yeah, similar to what other like people normally yeah. have for lunch. Um, so um, just to summarize, could you could you summarize for us what does um, how does holistic well-being in a professional context look in real life? I think we talked so much of that. So taking into consideration physical exercise, um, eating well, um, balancing work life in a way that both can be organized and planned in a way that also enable for social engagement, getting mm -hmm. to know each other, not only as colleagues, but as human beings and with our strengths and um, without yeah. going into too much personal detail, but knowing enough of each other to be um, respectful and understanding mm -hmm. of time constraints when a child is ill or those without children mm -hmm. have other obligations. And it doesn't, this is also sometimes what, what single or people in, in a professional context experience that don't have kids that they're always expected to chip in where many of them look after their parents or yep. have other yep. hobbies that are highly demanding so yep. and all of that can be voiced to each other to understand what each of us is dealing mm. with besides work and then finding a balanced approach um, well, if, it, if some people don't don't connect with the word holistic, then there's another great word that I like to use, which is called integrated, integrated well-being. So when you're looking at it from a full, a whole body perspective or a whole person perspective, let's put it more more like that, a whole person perspective. You know, you have your pillars of well-being, and my three pillars that I work according to are move, nourish, and resource, and when we think about nourish, nourish is not necessarily just the food we eat, but it's also do we take nourishment from uh, our surroundings? Are we being nourished by our uh, activities, like you say, our social activities? Uh, because social well-being is, is, is such an important part as well of a balanced life. Um, so where are we taking our nourishment from? And what does that look like? And is it healthy nourishment? And, and I will talk about infobesity after this. But again, what are we consuming in terms of not just uh, food, but also other, other activities? And is that giving us the best possible nourishment? Mm. And when I talk about resource, 
again, I'm looking at from a different perspective, not just necessarily um, what resources do we have at our disposal, but also what resources us, what gives us that moment of ooh, uplifting or, oh, I feel so great. I feel like re, re as we said, uh, um, reborn almost. What, what kind of activities could we be doing? It's not just necessarily mindfulness or meditation or yoga. It could be something else like looking at a beautiful artwork or a walk in nature, but what is giving us that, that sensation of being resourced and then move? And move for me is not just about physical movement. It's also about, am I so fixed in my thinking that I can't shift the way that I'm thinking? You know, how can I make change? Because if we move our ideas, um, we start to unblock things, you know, great things could be happening. Um, and the same way with moving in terms of furniture. I mean, am I sitting in the best location or where do I do my thinking? Where do I get my greatest ideas? Is there a place? Can I move myself to a place which is going to give me the greater inspiration? So those are say that my the three pillars that are part of the Olea structure is move, nourish and resource. And we I work with people within that to find a way to build that into their lives. And that then brings me to my 202020. That you have three things there. So if you could say, how do I allocate 20 minutes to resource, 20 minutes to nourish, and 20 minutes to, um, to move? You know, we all are entitled to a 60 minute break at lunchtime. You could get your 20 minutes, your 202020 in, in that space or otherwise break it up over the day and say, right, I'm gonna take a 10 minute resource break. And I'm going to go and sit outside and look at the trees and allow myself just to be in the moment. So if we can kind of like adapt that 20, 20, 20, whether it's 20 minutes or it's just it's just even 20 seconds sometimes, you know, just to take some breathing. But try to break it up over those uh, those three pillars of well-being. Yeah, no, that's really that's a very easy formula to, to, take, to keep in mind and live along. Yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. And um, maybe each of us who are listening to us now also try to do the same, can map that out for the day and the week and figure out what can we do. And this can also change, right? Throughout the Absolutely. week. We have Absolutely. To, to, yeah, to do. Uh, well. Maybe, sorry, Joe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, could you say that again? Um, I'm just thinking like in my, like for me, it would be walking the dogs and then having one day in the week where, you know, I do a little bit of a longer walk um, just to fulfill the trend, like to make it conscious and conscious activity. Yeah. And then enjoying yeah. that consciously also as, as we're undergoing. Yeah. And again, if people are really stuck for time, maybe you start off with for me, what's going to bring me the biggest, the biggest return on my time investment, maybe it's that resource that that's stepping away. And so stepping away, uh, doing something, listening to some music, meditation, whatever, maybe that's the one thing that you you get focused on. And you make that your, your, let's say, uh, change habit for the month. And Yes, it will take longer than a month to actually make a lasting habit, but you start to get into a routine and then before you know it, it becomes a non-negotiable. That's what we're looking for is that the activities become a non-negotiable. Sorry, I have to go and do that now. I need, because you see the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the key thing is when we start to recognize what did we change and what did it bring us in terms of benefits, then you're less likely to want to let anybody take that away from you. Yeah. It's probably also like, I think all of us can relate to a feeling of, oh, I have to work harder in order to finally accomplish whatever I'm trying to do here. And then I don't know if that ever played out, but all of us um, keep pushing that thought <laughs> until <laughs> also like the impression I learned recently, like until we're blue in the face, like literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I prefer the, uh, let's not work harder, let's work smarter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the other like the turned around um, to to realize and to know, and then also to to practice that we it's like we need recreational time. 
we are biological systems who need to recharge like yep. and we do that through eating through resting we allow our system to our muscles to grow they need time to grow after exercise and the same with the brain like yep. for us to comprehend for us to understand to be able to grow from your axons and neurons neur neuronal connections like we need rest <laughs> and not only during the night so but and then there's also the pomodoro technique is that sometimes that you also um sometimes talk about in your consultations that we have yeah. work sprints for like 20 30 minutes and then give ourselves a break when it comes there are, to there are some lots of different methods that we could be adopting mm -hmm. and pomodoro is one of them um, there's the agile working technique as well, where you create these sprints mm -hmm. and then that sprint is maybe going to last a couple of weeks and you, you put together your, 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 your team for that and how you're going to be working together. But certainly on a daily basis, I think that we have a maximum amount of time and we, we know that personally, that we can focus on something before we get distracted mm -hmm. and it's leveraging that time to get the most out of it so for some people it might be i need an hour but then i need to walk away for 20 minutes other people it, i need the 20 minutes and then i need to get up after five and stretch my legs and come back again mm -hmm. get very personal but the, they do work I, I do believe that slogging it out sitting and pushing yourself beyond that limit mm -hmm. Is, is one unhelpful and two doesn't yield the results of the work that you want. Yeah, absolutely. Because we have this thing called info obesity, which is actually a, a term that's been around since the 1970s, but it's about the fact that in our world today, we are consuming enormous amounts of information from different sources. And that's why it's called obesity because we kind of like become a bit addicted to it as well. But we 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 have this fear of missing out, so we want to we want to take this, we want to we look look at that, and you know, from morning to night, we are suddenly getting ourselves like in so into the information that there comes a point where we're not actually absorbing it, we're consuming it, but we're not actually being able to let's say consolidate it and do anything with it um, to the point where the brain starts to actually say, oh my. Okay, not going to cope with that. Not, not even going to get. That's not even going to hit my my uh, my radar. And then we start to suffer with memory problems. Um, we, be, you know, we have fatigue. Uh, you know, and, and it can lead to more, let's say, more serious because we are constantly switching ourselves on and being stimulated. And yeah, sometimes when the information we're consuming is not is stressful, you know, we're putting our body into a stress response. I feel it also uh, makes it more difficult to come up with our own opinions because we're only consuming and there's no time to actually process the information yeah. and put an opinion upon it or out of it. Yeah. And then when we have conversa conversations with other people, like yeah. it's either heavily opinionated, not um, leaving yeah. room for any way to negotiate or finding compromises where you can still continue talking without getting too upset or angry on each other yeah um or we struggle to even have an opinion on certain facts and of course that should also it's also common amongst researchers like i think um we often feel that we cannot have a clear opinion because we know of all the question marks still remaining in the picture so it's difficult to say like with corona oh we do this and then everything will be fine like no we don't know like just yet and maybe we will never know because the virus is always ahead of us but still when it comes to information i think as humans or any species on this planet really need some level of information and not too much not too little in order to mm -hmm. build opinions and make decisions to be able to survive and to be able to be healthy again yeah. And again, it's like, where am I getting my information from? Am I going to the fast food, the fast foods, the fast food tent to get it, or am I going to the uh, the healthy healthy shop to get it? It's you know, where are we consuming it? What are we consuming? And is it qualitative? There's so much noise out there that I think some of the really good stuff is getting lost. It's it's funny, like there's so many similarities between 
food and news or information generally. It's just that um, food tends to be overprocessed when it becomes unhealthy and yeah. for information if it's under processed. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, first, I, I think information can also be a good thing. But, yeah. We come back to that time and time scenario again is that the information that we get given we're not being given the time to actually digest it and i come back to another food analogy here mm. so we could be we could be eating i say consuming all this information but we're not given the time to read it properly we're not given the time to understand it and to process it so you can really draw a conclusion there is that of that stuffing your face with food and your body really doesn't have a time to to catch up and, and digest things properly because we're not chewing things properly um and that leads to then problems in the stomach and, and, I, and I, you know i can see so many similarities here mm. <laughs> so i don't think there's any wonder that they called it infobesity yeah no it's a it's a pointed term like which i haven't heard before and makes a lot of sense once i know it mm. <laughs> or now that i know it so we introduced you as the as a World Wellness Weekend Ambassador um, yes. in section to this um, podcast episode. What is the World Wellness Weekend and what are you doing as an ambassador and what are the activities that are being pulled up? Yeah, well, it's one of the uh, biggest international events that's going to unite uh, many countries throughout the globe on the weekend of 16, 17 and 18 September. It's always around about the same time every year around the equinox, which is very important uh, time for, uh, again, showing the life work balance. Mm -hmm. And what the objective is, is to try to unite people together to who are actually in our in the wellness branch or who have something that they want to share with the world that will help people be well, because we are aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number three, wellness for all. So it's about people opening their doors on that weekend and giving a 60 minute fun free activity um, to help people discover all the different methods and, and things we can learn about being well. Uh, it can be social well-being, it could be physical well-being, mental well-being. We can touch so many different areas. And in fact, World Wellness Weekend actually has its own five pillars of wellness. Mm -hmm. And this year, we really want to highlight the importance of pillar number five, which is all about purpose and solidarity. Mm -hmm. So bringing people together, sharing, creating communities of wellness throughout the world. And, you know, why not in a workplace environment, get your team together and devise for your team a well activity that you can promote on that weekend and get everybody to join in. It could be something like uh, going out and doing a, a, a walk together and at the same time picking up uh, rubbish or doing a river cleanup or a beach cleanup, uh, planting trees. The, all of these things are uh, very much part of what we promote at World Wellness Weekend because it's not just about wellness for human beings, it's also about wellness for the planet as well. Mm. And all the critters and species that surround us. Absolutely. Share this planet with. <laughs> yeah, now it sounds like really, I was going to say holistic, but integrative or both. <laughs> um, the work that you do and uh, yeah, I'm personally grateful and I'm sure many of the listeners can also appreciate what you shared with us today. Um, I just want to point out your website, olea-absolutenutrition.com. What does olea stand for? Well, olea actually is a Latin name for the olive tree. And I chose that because, I mean, the olive tree has comes with so many different sort of meanings and symbols as well. Uh, from a nutritional perspective, uh, great antioxidant, great uh, profile for the oil, but also, you know, we use the olive branch as a symbol of peace. Um, the trees can live for many, many hundreds of years. Uh, I, I just think for me, it just, it just sums up very much what I want to promote in terms mm. of resilience, um, again, peace, harmony. Mm. 
and I love the Mediterranean. And according to my genetic profiling that I did to find out which diet suits me better, the Mediterranean diet is the one for me. So <laughs> I don't think it was any, any uh, coincidence that I chose the Olea. Mm, and it's always yummy. Like I drown everything in olive oil. Yeah. <laughs> and chili peppers. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us um, today. I I would like also sharing about the World Wellness Weekend. Um, we make sure that we announce that appropriately and properly and loudly in the ATP Access to Perspectives community to our members and followers. And um, yeah, hope to have you back here at some point. Maybe um, yeah, if any of your listeners is interested in getting in touch with Julie or book and hire her for services, you find the website and her um, communication channels, like your LinkedIn, Julie, um, in the show notes or in the affiliate, like in the blog post to this episode. And yeah, welcome back and happy mental and physical well-being everyone thank you thank you joe for having me it's been great to be able to share my passion with your listeners and uh, i really hope that you have some takeaways from this yeah. so it would be my pleasure to come back again it's yeah warmly invited <laughs>